Right, good morning members, officers and any members of the public who are attending this meeting in, uh, in person or remotely or just viewing the webcast. Uh, welcome to this meeting of South Cambridgeshire District Council Cabinet. Uh, the normal procedure in Cabinet is that we take votes by affirmation and we'll continue with that tradition. Uh, when we move to a vote on any item, I'll ask if members agree with the proposal. Um, but only members who are present in the chamber today will be able to move and second motions or to vote. And mes members present virtually will be able to speak in the, deba in the debate. Um, so if members who are attending virtually would indicate a wish to speak by using the chat in the Teams meeting, please. And then, uh, then I'll bring them into the, into the debate as quickly as I can. And uh, those present in council chamber just raise your hands as normal. So, can I just confirm that the meeting is quorum, please? Jonathan? Thank you, Leader. I can confirm the meeting is quorum. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. So, um, now I think we've got non-Cabinet members present. I think um, we've got Councillor Claire Daunton present, Councillor Anna Bradnam present, uh, Councillor Peter MacDonald, who's a me member of Cabinet, and Councillor Richard Williams, as far as I can see. So welcome to all of you, and welcome to... Oh, and Councillor and Councillor Sue Ellington. Sorry, sorry, Sue. I, oh, I can see your name there, written very small. Jolly good. And uh, welcome to ex-Councillor Douglas De Lacey. It's always lovely, lovely to see you. So thank you for uh, giving up your morning to come and come and join us. Right. So moving on. Um, item two is apologies for absence. So Jonathan, what apologies for absence do we have, please? So we've received apologies for absence from Councillor John Williams, the lead cabinet member for finance, and Grenville Chamberlain, the chair of the scrutiny and overview committee. Thank you very much. Do we have Councillor Judith Ripper, the vice chair of scrutiny and overview, present, please? She's, she's, got into the meeting, but, um... she's, she's on her way. Jolly good. Thank you. Righty ho. Uh, item three: declarations of interest. Do any members have interests to declare in relation to any item of business on this agenda? No. Uh, if any interests subsequently become apparent, uh, just raise them at that point, please. So, moving on to the minutes of the previous meeting, members are asked to approve the minutes of the meeting held on the 7th of February 2022, and I move the approval of those minutes as a correct record. Uh, are there any issues arising from those minutes? No. And Councillor Neil Goff, I think you're seconding. I'll second those. Thank yep. you. So, do members approve the minutes? Anyone wish to vote against? And anyone wish to abstain? No. Okay, thank you. So Cabinet therefore agrees the approval of the minutes as a correct record by affirmation. Um, public questions. Um, we've received two public questions. Um, the first from Mr Daniel Fulton. Um, is Mr Fulton in the meeting, please? No. no? All right. So we will send Mr Fulton a written, re written reply to the question that he's submitted. Um, so moving on to uh, Dr. Douglas De Lacey, um, would you like to uh, put your question, please? Thank you very much, Leader. My question is as on your order paper. Thank you very much, and I think Councillor Neil Goff is going to respond to your to your question. I am indeed, uh, Leader. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. De Lacey, for your question. Very good to see you as well. So uh, welcome. Um, so I'm going to give you um, what hopefully will be a fairly full response to your question, but feel free to um, follow up with a supplementary, as you are well aware, is your right to do so afterwards. Um, so having spent uh, 24 minutes on the phone to a certain ferry company on Friday before giving up uh, and hanging up, um, and then a further 33 minutes on Saturday before finally reaching a customer service person, um, I really understand very much the frustration of the long wait on the call center, which I think is your, the, the focus of your question. However, the experience I had last week was not just about the wait time, it was exacerbated by several other things. The terrible music, the repetitive instruction to go to the website to solve my problem, when the reason I was calling was that the website told me that I had to call to solve my problem. Um, the lack of any information on where I was in the queue, 
and any other information which was provided about how long I was going to be able to have to wait. So it is very difficult to capture the experience of frustration in a KPI. Um, what we have reported, as you uh, have highlighted in your question, is the basic average call wait time. And I'm sure you've noticed that progress is being made in that, in the sense that in December 2021, that was down just to 32 seconds. And I agree with you, it is a very crude me measure um, because it doesn't, it doesn't uh, uh, um, uh, give you any indication as to what the, the, the potential range of outcomes are. Um, but I assure you, we've been thinking about the problem since you've left the council. The new telephony system does give us the ability to monitor wait times with additional granularity to annual analyze the situation and understand the nature of the problem. For example, um, we've looked at the simple relationship between the number of calls received per day and average wait times. And unsurprisingly, this indicates that the call center can cope with calls in the range of 600 to 700 calls per day very effectively. But then as soon as those call times, call rates increase beyond 600 to 700, Call wait times increase dramatically as the number of calls being added to the system exceeds what can be actually dealt with. And it's those sort of insights which have been really helpful in trying to address the root uh, objective, which is to imp improve the level of service. Um, we've also been introducing new features to address the frustration of the long wait directly. The most significant of these is the callback service, which has been operating since November. The call kickback kicks in at five minutes and gives the caller the opportunity to receive a callback from the council. And it stops the long tail of waits that you were very concerned about. And it's quite interesting to note that even in December, when that call wait time had been reduced to 32 seconds, there were still 118 callbacks which we received. So even when there's 32 seconds, that's at least 118 people who are waiting more than five minutes who actually get a callback. So with this complexity in our new features, we certainly need to try and improve the, the, the KPIs, but I'm not sure that the standard deviation itself would really offer much greater insight, particularly when those, obscure, those would obscure very different experiences on very different days when call rates are very different and they would be expressed over a monthly average. So after a lot of consideration and discussion with Mr. Membry, what we will do um, from April is that we will start to publish as part of our KPIs the percentage of calls that we receive that wait for more than five minutes to be answered. And we will also publish what percentage of those calls, which last longer than five minutes, request a callback. That will highlight both the number of people who are exposed to the long wait issue and the effectiveness of our callback service in serving those residents. Thank you very much for your question. Thank you. Um, Dr. De Lacy, would you like to ask a supplementary question? If I may, Leader, please, yes. Um, I'm very aware of much more frustration than the call centre provides. Uh, my uh, parish council banks with the cooperative bank, uh, which normally leaves you for between 45 and 90 minutes before it answers the phone. So um, I think we're doing pretty well. Uh, the reason why I asked my question was I did look at a set of statistics that Mr. Membry gave me shortly before I left. I was very surprised to discover that there is a very large number of calls which are terminated within five seconds. And that, of course, affects the average very significantly. So I'm delighted to hear uh, that there will be figures about calls of more than five minutes and also uh, the fact that callback is allowed. Um, one other datum that I think could be usefully provided is um, the actual numbers rather than, or not rather than, as well as the percentages. So we have some idea of just how many of our residents are not actually receiving the care we'd like to give them. And I wonder if that would be a possible addition. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Goff, do you want to pick up on that? 
yes, I think that's a, that's a good idea. It, it's, as I mentioned, um, part of, a, a large part of the experience is simply a function of the number of calls which we receive, which is why the average wait times tend to go up, for example, around the time people receive their council tax um, bills, because we get a lot of calls. So actually, um, at the very least, um, in, the, in the remarks section, sort of relating the experience of the call wait time to, and, and the, the, the waits of more than five minutes, to the volume of calls would also be a good idea. So we will take that on board as well. So thank you for that suggestion. Thank you very much. And perhaps, Dr. Delos, you might like to come back in six months' time and tell us whether uh, we're, being, we're being successful. Um, I wish you and Penny uh, good health and it'd be lovely to see you soon. Okay. Thank, Thank you very you much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, right, so moving on, issues arising from the Scrutiny and Overview Committee. Have we got. Okay, so we've got a problem getting the Vice Chair of Scrutiny of Overview in. So we'll, when we've got her in, uh, we, will, we will pick up that item with her, with her then. Um, so moving on to item seven, which is the quarter three performance report. Sorry, let me just get it, get it up. Um, starting on page, ni page 19. So this is a pretty self-explanatory document. Um, and I'm very pleased with the way that uh, these reports are presented these days. It makes the, the information very, very accessible. I think we continue to perform very well, bearing in mind we are still in the middle of a pandemic. I think it's quite extraordinary that actually we've, uh, uh, we've, we've managed to keep so very much stuff in, in, the green, in the green, quite honestly, at a time when I'm sure, I think lots of other councils have um, really caved in. Obviously, things like bed and breakfast, um, you know, we have had a government directive to, uh, to be housing, housing people in bed and breakfast when they've had um, they've been affected by homelessness. So obviously, the bill for that continues to accelerate. Um, but I think other than that, it's pretty self-explanatory. Are there any questions on any of it, please? Uh, yes, Councillor Brian Milnes. Uh, thank you. I, I just wanted to make reference to um, the efforts of the um, uh, BIN uh, service. Um, as you know, we've had uh, significant staff absences still. Um, some of these have been because uh, they've put off uh, taking uh, annual leave and, and, until now. Um, and uh, obviously COVID is still um, part and parcel of that equation. But I'd just like to report back from some of the feedback we've had online uh, over recent weeks, which has been very supportive of the Bing crews. Um, they know they've been going the extra mile, literally, um, and uh, they've been working Saturdays to try and uh, um, uh, make sure that the green bin collections were picked up if uh, they hadn't managed on their regular day. Uh, so I'd just like to uh, publicly thank the uh, service uh, for the work that they've done and hope that it's going to be restored to a normal service as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Councillor Neil Goff. Yeah, so um, thank you, uh, Leader. Um, so um, th there were a number of comments at scrutiny uh, which were made about uh, the report which we've picked up on um, in, this, in this document, which I just wanted to highlight. So in terms of the format, um, the, uh, the um, introduction basically now signposts the color, color coding which is being applied to Appendix B in terms of the um, uh, delivery of the business plan objectives. Also, as requested in scrutiny, all the line, cha all the line charts now have labels. Um, unfortunately, these are fairly small, which is the reason they weren't provided in previously, but hopefully they're helpful in providing some context. In terms of the KPIs in Appendix A, AH21 now contains a short sentence to reflect the works being done to improve the publicity of properties to ensure that those bidding on properties are well informed. Um, CC305, which was the uh, issue around the um, complaints, now contains a commentary on the number of open cases at the end of the period, which was requested, I think, by Councillor Heather Williams. 
uh, and that shows the very significant progress that's been made in clearing that backlog. Um, the measure itself will now become more useful now that we're no longer mixing current and past complaints. And then in terms of Appendix B, both B5.2 and B5.3, um, the ratings will remain unchanged, but the items now contain updated comments in the light of the discussion at scrutiny, providing a clearer picture of the consultation that has play, taken place and the status of the civic hub plans based on uh, further information provided by officers. So thank you to uh, Mr. Membry and to Mr. Ledger for updating the report in that way. Thank you. Thank you, and I believe you're going to second. Oh, second, yes. Okay, yes. So my thanks also to uh, Kevin Ledger, who has really um, taken responsibility for consistently improving the way that we, pre we present this data. Um, and, uh, you know, the narrative now is very self-explanatory, so it's massively improved on, on what it was. And thank you to uh, uh, Jeff as well for his oversight of this. Um, okay, so um, in the absence of anything from scrutiny. Is this a problem we're going to be able to resolve? Uh, I can't be on the no, oh dear, okay, all right, thank you. Um, so is there any, are there any questions from anybody other than cabinet members on this? No, no? okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, so the recommendation is set out in paragraph three of the report. Uh, to A, note the KPI results and comments at Appendix A and progress against the business plan actions at Appendix B. And B, note the reduction in target in relation to land charges search response days as part of a phased return to pre-COVID target levels by the new financial year, as detailed within the comments section at SX025 at Appendix A. So do members agree with the proposal? Agreed. Anyone want to vote against? Anyone wish to abstain? Thank you. Cabinet therefore agrees that the proposals by affirmation. So moving on now to item eight, the annual equality scheme update and progress report. And Councillor Bill, uh, so, sorry, Councillor Toomey Hawkins is going to present this, and I believe Councillor Bill Handley, you're going to second it. Thank you very much indeed. So Councillor Hawkins. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> um, Thank you. The, the, uh, the, the report before you this morning is, uh, is to update on how the equality scheme that we adopted um, at the end of 2020 is progressing. And just to remind us, as a public authority, we must have due regard to the aims of the general equality duty within the Equality Act, which came to force in 2011. Um, also, uh, you remember that this council uh, voted to adopt an equality motion um, after the George Floyd incidents back in uh, 14th of July, 2020. Um, and that also has um, uh, had an impact on um, how we're dealing with uh, equality issues. So to meet the equality aims, we did set up three objectives, which was to understand the level of diversity in the district come up with actions and processes that will help us level up, which is the phrase that we are using these days, and the outcomes of those in identified disadvantaged groups. To be an employer that appreciates the strength that we can get from a diverse workforce and to widen that opportunity uh, for diverse groups. And thirdly, to make sure that protected groups are included and have their voices heard when we discuss issues to do with the future of the district. Um, and actually we did do a lot of that when we did our, um, our first conversation and our first proposals um, in creating the Emerging Local Plan, which is, as you know, um, <laughs> close to my heart. Um, I just want to thank the Race Equality Task and Finish Group for all the work that they have done on getting us this far and on whose recommendation I am now the cabinet champion for uh, race equality. Um, I can say that we as a council have gone quite a way in embedding equality and diversity in our usual council activities. We also are an equality opportunities employer. We have an apprentice scheme and we're offering hybrid working for our staff. And some of the other ways that we have embedded equality and diversity includes creating a calendar of notable dates, which we mark. Um, mark with events, 
um, which, we, which are lined up by the team. Uh, we also carry out equality impact assessments when we're developing policies. Can I just mention perhaps a couple of these when it comes to reviewing access to housing and uh, homelessness, homelessness support? As you might remember, um, in, recent, you know, in view of recent events, we are doing a lot to help refugees um, who come to the UK who are homeless and have helped to house eight Afghan families. Um, and also, one of the things we're doing is uh, identifying the fact that in the race equality motion that we adopted, uh, the black and minority ethnic access to housing um, and homelessness had not been good, but we are doing something about that. Um, we obtained initial data, which was given to the Task and Finish Group uh, back in 2021. And um, we are hoping to have a review of the numbers this year at some point, um, just to see how well we are working on that particular strategy. So there's a lot more in the report, as you will see. Um, but I just want to say thank you uh, to Kevin and the entire qualities team um, for their hard work in getting us this far. And actually, those who have attended some of the events that we've um, had, like you know, Black History Month, the LGBT Plus History Month, the Gypsies and Travelers, uh, and the Disabilities History Month, will know just how hard um, the team have been working to make sure that we are up there and doing the best that we can. I will therefore like to propose a recommendation as it is in paragraph three. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Hawkins. That was really helpful. Uh, Councillor Handley, do you want to speak on this? I don't think I want to add very much more from what uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Councillor Hawkins has said, except to, to say I endorse it and uh, thank the officers um, for a clear and well-presented report. That's very good. Okay, any questions from members of Cabinet? No. Anybody else like to... Uh, like to ask any questions? Okay, thank you very much indeed. So, uh, the recommendations set out in paragraph, uh, let me just make sure I'm on the right bit here. Right, set out at paragraph three of the report. Um, A, approve adoption of the revised equality scheme at Appendix A and B, review the Equality Scheme Action Plan Progress Report in Appendix B, detailing progress against actions set in the 2020-21 iteration of the Equality Scheme. So do members agree with the proposal? Agree. Anyone wish to vote against? Anyone wish to abstain? Okay, the Cabinet therefore agrees the proposals by affirmation. And moving on to Item 9, which is Parental Leave Policy. Um, and... I am going to present this, so uh, so thank you. So this was um, as cross-party support. Um, you know, we all agree it was uh, it's a really important thing to do in order to um, ensure that uh, we have a membership of councillors representing um, all age all age groups. That um, being a parent doesn't preclude you from being a counsellor, and because in fact it's really important that we have counsellors who um, represent people with uh, young children and with um, with with families. And um, our job is to make it as easy as we possibly as we possibly can for people. So I'm very grateful for this report, um, which um, again, jo uh, Jonathan Corbett. Has led, has led on this from HR, so thank you very much, Jonathan. And um, I think Jeff Membry again has had uh, oversight of it. So we've obviously kept you very busy, Jeff, recently, since you seem to, most of these reports seem to be attributed to you. Um, so the recommendations are that we adopt this policy, and be, this has to go to council because it's a permanent change to the six month rule which is in our constitution. So it's not something that uh, cabinet can just uh, just approve. It has to go onto council. And in fact, I think it's going to council tomorrow. So that's, uh, that's about the speediest turnaround we get. Um, council Hawkins, I think you're seconding this. Do you want to add anything? Uh, yes, I'm seconding. Just to say very quickly that um, from an equality impact assessment um, viewpoint, I'm glad that um, we are actually um, doing this because um, it just means that, you know, we are opening the door to more 
families or parents to be involved in, um, um, in the work of the council. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so I've got question, any questions from cabinet members? No, um, I'm going to invite Councillor Claire Daunton, who I also need to thank. She's taken a very uh, important lead role in delivering this and in uh, liaising with members. So, uh, Councillor Daunton. Um. Can, you come, can you come off mute, please, Claire? Yeah, yeah. sorry. I know you popped on it. It seems as being very touchy today. Yeah. Is that clear now? That's good. That's good. Yes, thank you. Um, I want to echo your thanks to Jonathan Corbett for his sterling work on this uh, document and for the trouble that he's taken um, to uh, consult um, LGA documentation and um, the documentation of other councils. Um, and to recommend it for adoption, I think it's really good that we're able to do this. Um, thank you. Thank, thank you very much indeed. I think Jonathan was very supported by Democratic Services, so our thanks, thanks to them also. Okay, so if there are... Oh, sorry, uh, Councillor Anna Bradman. Thank you, Leader. Um, I just wanted to uh, endorse this report, and I think it's a, a very good idea and, and is going to enable a wider variety of people to take part in council life, and I think that's so important. Um, but one of the things I just wanted to check is that given that we need to be able to pay the person who is on maternity leave or paternity leave, um, while we might need to also um, provide infill staff for that role, I just wanted to make sure we're making the financial um, provision necessary for that. Bradden. Well, this this is specifically about member parental leave. So I think that's already. I think your your question is already dealt with in the parental leave policy for our staff. So you know we're talking here specifically about member parental leave. So my understanding is that members continue to receive their allowance um, even when they are when they are on on parental leave. Um, I'm sure even members even on parental leave will still get uh, lots of their residents ringing them up asking them for advice and help. So thank you very much. Okay, so we are going to move on to the recommendation. And the recommendation is that to recommend to council the adoption of this policy. So um, members agree with the proposal? Uh, anyone wish to vote against? And anyone wish to abstain? The cabinet therefore agrees the proposals by affirmation. And now item 10, which is the 2021-22 uh, revenue and capital budget monitoring quarter three and Councillor Neil Gough is going to re recommend this and I will second it. Great. Uh, thank you, Lena. Um, thank you, Mr. Maddox and his team for putting this together. Um, I don't really have much to um, say on this report. It, uh, the, the variances are, are sort of quite modest as you'll see through the report. I do just though, want to draw some attention to paragraph 17, which is quite interesting, which, um, which looks at the uh, the potential impact of um, higher fuel prices uh, associated with the current situation in terms of our budget. It's not so much an issue for today, but, it's, well, it's an issue for today. Um, but uh, certainly when you, you look at 22, 23, um, the, uh, the potential impact of, of that could be quite, quite significant. Um, obviously, it's not within the scope of this report, which is looking at 21, 22, but I thought members would be of interest uh, to it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so we are doing some other other work looking at the uh, the impact of the Ukraine crisis on um, the organisation operationally, but also the impact on our residents <coughs> and in particular our tenants, of course. So do any cabinet members have any questions? Are there any questions from anyone else? Nope. OK, so. Um, Cabinet's recommended to note the forecast 21-22 revenue position against the approved revenue budget shown in Appendix B, projected major variances with the reasons for these variances at Appendices C1 and C2 and the action being taken to address the underlying issues, and B, note the latest capital programme for 21-22 position and variances, if any, as shown at Appendix D. So I'm happy to second that. And um, do members agree with the proposals? Anyone wish to vote against? Anyone wishing to abstain? So Cabinet therefore agrees the proposals by affirmation. Thank you very much. 
Um, we now come to item 11, which is small land sales, and uh, Councillor John Batchelor is going to introduce the report, and I think Councillor Toomey Hawkins is seconding it. So over to you, Councillor Batchelor. Uh, thank you, Leader. Uh, small land sales, this is precisely what it is. It's a tidying up policy uh, to make sure that we, we actually have something um, in writing that ensures that there's a fair and equitable way that we deal with tenants who um, want to purchase more elements of land. Uh, I should make this clear that this is only ab about very small patches of land, normally extensions of gardens and so on, and uh, the land has no commercial value. Certainly the larger, we have different policies for larger pieces of land where our preference will always be where it's possible to actually build our own um, social housing. So um, I commend it to you. The recommendation is a paragraph four. Uh, I don't think it's a very, um, uh, there's no other issues involved here. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hawkins. Uh, yeah, thank you, Leader. Um, I'm pleased to support um, this policy um, as uh, someone who has someone in my ward who's looking for something like this. Um, we can get on with it and uh, get it resolved. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, the important thing is that it's a slick, it's a slick operation for something that's fairly simple. Okay, thank you. So any questions? Nope. Okay, uh, the rec cabinet's recommended to um, approve the draft policy on small land transactions, HRA, attached to Appendix A, uh, to be considered by the Housing Engagement Board and authorise delegated authority to the lead member for housing to approve the final policy subject to minor amendments, if any, arising from the Housing Engagement Board. So do members agree with the proposal? Thank you. Anyone vote against? Anyone wish to abstain? Cabinet therefore agrees the proposals by affirmation. And item 12, renewal of home improvement agency service level agreement. Um, that is Councillor John Batchelor again, this time seconded by Councillor Bill Handley. Yep, thank you. So John Batchelor, thank you. Thank you, Leader. Uh, home improvement agency is a shared service. Um, uh, the contract is coming up for renewal. Uh, it works with the disabled and vulnerable in our communities to um, um, improve life for them. So it's uh, a valuable service. We have had some concerns about the performance in recent times uh, with very long waiting times. This is being addressed now and we're making regular monitoring exercises um, but basically, it's a good service that we want to continue. Recommendation is at uh, paragraph four, and I commend it to Cabinet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Handley? I'm nothing to add. I'm uh, happy to second. Thank you. Thanks very much. So, and this is actually a really important service. And my understanding is that there had been huge improvements prior to the pandemic in performance, you know, really, really good improvements. And then, of course, the pandemic. Um, set everything back, but not as badly as as it might it might have done. So it's you know hopefully they will they will get back to where they were um, as quickly as possible because it is a vital service uh, which really makes a difference to people's lives. Uh, so cabinets, oh, sorry, any questions from anyone? No. Okay. So cabinets recommended to approve the renewal of the Cambridgeshire Home Improvement Agency shared service level agreement for a further three years, up to the 31st of March 2025, at Appendix A, and the continuation of the current funding arrangements with the County Council. So members agree with the proposal? Anyone wishing to vote against? Anyone want to abstain? No. So cabinet therefore agrees the proposals by affirmation. Gosh, we're getting through the later knots here. Um, so number. Th Maybe, maybe famous last words. <laughs> um, item 13, the interim position statement on first homes. So, Councillor Batchelor introducing this and Councillor Hawkins seconding it. Councillor Batchelor. Yeah, thank you very much, Leader. First homes, can I just remind um, members, this is uh, one of the government's um, latest idea um, about getting people on the housing ladder. 
It's a discount market housing um, scheme, which means that uh, developers uh, provide housing at a discount of between 30 and 50% of the market rates. So it's actually the developer who um, does all the initial work in getting the um, clients and so on. Uh, where we came in, come into it is that it has to be administered in the long term. Um, you know, members will also uh, recall that we were rather um, dismayed at this particular policy because there was a requirement by government that 25% of all housing delivered by S106, or in other words, um, affordable housing, had to be uh, it was first homes. So this clearly would, uh, would mean that we would have to reduce our um, the amount of rented accommodation that we could provide and the shared uh, ownership arrangements. What this paper uh, does is set out our proposals about um, what should happen in the event that the 25% of housing is taken for first homes and how we deal with the rented side and the shared ownership. Um, what our proposal is an option two, which suggests that we maintain the rental element at the same level as, as we are uh, delivering now, but shared homes would fall back to take account of the 25% of the um, first homes. So it's a regrettable thing. Um, the good news is that like many things recently, the government has actually changed its mind. Uh, and it is now said that this is no longer a requirement. So thank goodness for that. Uh, uh, it's no longer a requirement, but it's a choice on the part of the developer. So we still have to have in place a policy to deal with it should developers wish to take this call. So what is before you is the policy at option two. Um, uh, I would particularly say thanks very much to Julie Fletcher, who, who's actually produced a very clear uh, and concise report. Uh, and I hope we can take this forward. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, my thanks to Julie as well. It's been uh, complicated, I think, to battle the way through this uh, ever-changing minefield of this. Uh, Councillor Hawkins, do you want to comment on it? Uh, yeah, thank you, Leader. Um, I think it, it's the, the, the points made about the effect on um, shared homes really was what was of concern um, to me as well. And of course, from an equality point of view, yes, families who are looking to purchase a home will be affected because of that. But at the same time, we have young people or first-time buyers who are looking for first homes. At the end of the day, now that the change has been made and it's, that it's down to the developer, we'll see how it goes. We'll have to monitor it, of course, and see just how, um, you know, how this affects us in delivering homes for people who really need it in the way that they need it to be affordable for them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, in reality, there's no affordable homes in, uh, in South Cambridgeshire. They're all extremely expensive. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, so the Cabinet's recommended to approve the great, Greater Cambridge First Homes Interim Position Statement and be delegate authority to the lead member for housing to approve any subsequent minor amendments and edited changes that do not materially affect the content of the Interim Position Statement. So um, do members agree with the proposal? Anyone voting against? Anyone wish to abstain? Cabinet therefore agrees to proposals by affirmation. And sticking with Councillor John Batchelor, we now have fixed term tenancies, which actually is a good news item, and I'm very happy to second this. So, John Batchelor again. Uh, thank you very much, Leader. So, fixed term tenancies were introduced about nine years ago by the government, um, and it is just what it says. Um, 
all the tenancies were given, new tenancies were given out on a, a fixed 10 year term. Um, the, these are coming to an end or they're being come up for renewal next year. Um, this is no longer government policy. Um, and our proposal here is that we revert to lifetime secure tenancies um, uh, which we've been using previously and we are using currently. So it's only fair for all those concerned. Um, I think it's good news. Uh, it's simply the right thing to do that people have secure tenancies. Um, so I, uh, I recommend the proposal to you. Uh, thank you very much. This is another of those good ideas that turned out not to be quite such a good idea because we all know the one thing people want is security in their homes and knowing that they're not going to be turfed out at any moment. So I'm very happy, I'm very pleased that uh, we've got to this position. Uh, so any questions? No? So Cabinet's recommended to approve the proposal to end the use of fixed term... Oh, sorry? I must just put the question. Oh, uh, Councillor Bradman. Sorry, sorry I'd, I'd asked to ask a question after cabinet. Sorry, I'm moving quite fast, my apologies. That's okay. Um, I just wanted to um, understand the situation and it's just a matter of explanation really. What happens in the case of a lifetime tenancy at, at the end if younger members of the family are also resident in the house? I just, if, if sorry, what I mean is at the end of the lifetime. Does that then transfer to younger members of the family? I just wanted to understand that. Right. So, thank you. Perhaps Julie uh, I think Fletcher bring might, Julie might be. Thank you. Bring uh, Julie Fletcher in. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid it isn't a simple answer, um, unfortunately. It will depend on the tenancy type that that person has in terms of um, whether they had a secure tenancy before, I think it was the 1st of April 2012. Um, it, it's not a the succession rules change and then it, it's not a statutory requirement that it will go down to a family member if they're not a joint tenant. So um, each case will be looked at individually um, as it arises. And it may well be that actually that person doesn't need maybe a three bedroom house and we will look to um, how to house them somewhere um, smaller. So, so we will look at each case sensitively um, and individually as well, but they don't have the given right to just take on that tenancy in most cases. And if I may say, Leader, I'm, I'm much reassured by that because actually what I'm kept, um, thinking about is the, us protecting the usefulness and the, the, the capacity of our council housing. So actually, I'd, I'm glad to hear it's looked at on an individual basis so that we can make sure that we are providing housing for the people who need it, but we're not tying up the housing stock that we've got with tenants who might no longer need such a big house, say, for example. That's really reassuring. Thank you. Councillor Richard Williams. Uh, thank you very much, Leader. Um, it's just a question really that follows on from that last point. Um, when we when we do have these cases um, and somebody doesn't have automatic succession rights, I mean, I, I presume it is our policy that we try and rehouse if that's what we need to do in the same area, because I think it can be very disruptive sometimes if people are, they might understand the need not to have a three bedroom house, but if it involves, you know, moving a long way away, that, that's quite a big lifestyle um, change and Im impact. I'm going to ask, so, uh, yes, I like you, I hope it's the case. Um, Julie, do you want to come in? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so as I say, we would look at each case individually. Um, it really depends on their circumstances. Obviously, we wouldn't move them out of their support networks, etc. cetera. Um, but we'd also take into account things like affordability. So obviously, if we felt that they could afford to purchase on the open market or, or sort of... Um, privately, then we would have to look at all options. But as I say, it really depends on, on their situation in terms of their current, the current tenancy of um, the person who's deceased and um, what succession rights they have. But we would certainly not put somebody out on the streets without helping them to secure alternative accommodation. Do you want to come back, Mr. Williams? Uh, I, I... 
I, I might actually take take it up um, with with Julie offline if that's okay. That's 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 fine. That's fine. I mean, I have uh, every confidence in the uh, in the housing team. They are immeasurably caring of people, and I've seen numerous uh, numerous examples of that. So, um, moving on, then the uh, recommendation is to approve the proposal to end the use of fixed term tenancies for its own housing tenants and replace these with lifetime tenancies for both existing and new tenants. Council's approach to introductory tenancies will remain unchanged. Introductory tenancies are for a period of 12 months, but can be extended for a further 18 months if the tenancy has not been conducted in a satisfactory manner. So, do members agree with the proposal? Thank you. So, I'm just checking that. Yep. Uh, does anyone wish to vote against? Anyone wish to abstain? Cabinet, therefore, agrees the proposals by affirmation. Now, we're moving on to item 15, which is the Ermine Street Housing uh, Review of the Business Plan. Um, please note, Appendix A of this item is restricted as it's commercially sensitive. It's, um, it's not anticipated that decisions will need to take place on the appendix. However, if requested, a move to confidential session will be required. This includes the exempt scrutiny and overview report at agenda item 18. Um, so does anybody wish to discuss any of the exempt sensitive, commercially sensitive parts of this report? Okay, well, we can always move into closed session if anything changes, but uh, we'll stay in public session uh, for now. So, Councillor John Batchelor is going to present this, and I think Councillor Neil Goff is going to second it. Uh, thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, so, what we've got before us is the um, latest iteration of the Ermine Street Business Plan, um, subject to annual review. Uh, so, Ermine Street, as we know, was set up uh, several years ago with the object of um, um, getting to 500 houses. Um, that is just about um, to be met in, in the next uh, few, few weeks. Um, but Ermine Street is not just an investment vehicle. A, a point I'd like to make, at least initially, is that um, Omen Street is actually a close partner of our housing department. Um, for example, uh, they've provided three houses in Camborne, which are houses of multiple occupancy. Um, these are being used via Shire Homes as uh, temporary accommodation, which helps to, to um, service our bed and breakfast accommodation requirements. Equally, they have provided four properties uh, for Afghan refugees and are standing by should the need arise to do the same to support U um, Ukrainian refugees. Um, as well as renting uh, properties on the open market through their own ownership, they are also um, have a, a significant business in taking Ministry of Defence homes on five-year leases. They improve the properties and rent them out. They currently have three lease arrangements in place with the Defence Infrastructure Organisation. That's at Walter Beach, Bassingbourne and Brampton. All leases have been reviewed and extended for another five years. The number of units increased by six in Water Beach, five in Bassingwell, and 36 in Brampton, bringing the total number of lease properties to 190. The current acquisition position today is that the company has acquired 484 properties. There are three more in the pipeline. One is a block with 14 flats, and they have 14 separate titles, so they count as individual properties. Uh, so this will make a total of 500 the target, which was set back in 2015. Any future expansion in the form of additional housing beyond the 500 properties will be subject to further agreement from the council uh, with an agreement about future loan terms and rates. 
the company, the company's work will benefit the council by 3.43 million pounds in interest payments this year. The head of housing, head of Ermine Street, uh, Councillor John Williams and myself uh, meet on a regular basis to review strategy and possible future development with the council. Uh, Duncan Bessie and his small team has done a brilliant job here. They, they, have, they should really be congratulated on delivering very real benefits for South Cairns District Council and creating a solid business that is valuable and, uh, and an appreciating asset for the future. A good business, well done to all those concerned. I recommend the business plan to the cabinet. Thank you, Leader. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, that was a very good summary. Um, so if... Um, sorry, I just lost my place at the moment. Um, so, Councillor Neil Goff, you are seconding this. Do you want to add anything to that, please? Okay, okay, that's lovely. Thank you. Um, any questions from Cabinet? Any questions from anybody else on Ermine Street? Uh, Councillor Bradman. Uh, thank you, Leader. I just wanted to, um, sorry, it was really for after this item, but I just wanted to report, I have just spoken to Councillor Ripeth to see if she wanted to join me here to take part in the meeting, but she said the internet has been so problematic, she's going to give her apologies for the meeting. Very much, yes, she, she did message me. I think she's very frustrated that the um, team seems to have let her down at, at her end rather than ours, so, uh, so that's a shame. Uh, but we've had, their, we've had their reports. Okay, so moving on, if there's no more questions. Um, the recommendation set out in paragraph three of the report to approve in their capacity as shareholder the Ermine Street business plan for the period 2021-22 and to 20. 30-2031. Uh, do members agree with the proposal? Thank you. Anyone wish to vote against? And anyone wishing to abstain? Thank you. Cabinet therefore agrees the proposal by affirmation and my thanks to officers who've worked uh, very hard on this. Okay, so we're now going to come to item 16, which is the exclusion of the press and public. Um, it's the point in our agenda where we need to consider whether, whether to exclude the press and public from the meeting. This is because the next items contain information which is commercially sensitive. Members of the public are advised that if Cabinet agrees to exclude the press and public, the video stream will end. I therefore propose that the press and public be excluded from the meeting during consideration of the following items of business in accordance with section 100A brackets 4 of the Local Government Act 1972 on the grounds that, if present, there would be a disclosure to them of exempt information as defined in paragraph 3 of paragraph 1 of Schedule 12A of the Act, brackets as amended, is that seconded? I think Councillor Goff, yes, you are doing that. Uh, do members agree with the proposal? Anyone wish to vote against? Anyone abstaining? So Cabinet therefore agrees the proposal by affirmation. So members of the public who are watching the webcast, this means the video stream will now end. Thank you very much for joining us to view today's Cabinet meeting. And I note the next meeting of Cabinet is scheduled to take place on Monday the 13th of June at 2022 at 10 o'clock. Right, thank you very much.